And thanks a lot, Salinger. And just to correct you, Joe Rosales is now our section head at Virginia Mason. But thank you very much for the introduction. And before I start, I just want to mention that when we were under the shadow of COVID back in March, I took a, a flight to John McClure to attend um, a, a cancer session or a cancer congress with Benet and Tara. And I just want to say how impressed I was with the work that they're doing in Nepal. And if any of you have any curiosity or interest, uh, please go to their website and learn about it and see how you can participate. It is really, really a remarkable thing that they're accomplishing there. And they're on track with building a brand new hospital for patients with cancer in Janakpur. And it's really going to transform and truly revolutionize the care in that area of the world. Well, with that as a prelude, let me start with some rapid fire questions. And Samantha, you're going to control the, the slides, so I really appreciate that. And if we could go to the, the next slide. So the first one is a question, and it's true or false, is were tetanus made in therapy after transplantation provides a beneficial effect in young patients with mantle cell lymphoma? Um, so they, it's a true or false question. And if we could go to the answer to that question, next slide. Uh, the answer is false. And I'm going to talk in a moment about a phase two trial which demonstrated no positive effect when Velcade maintenance therapy after transplantation was used in young mantle cell lymphoma patients. And this is uh, what's called the Hogan study, and it was presented at ASCO and was recently published in the British Journal of Hematology as well. And so if we could go to the next slide. Um, and this is basically just a quick slide to say that there were 140 patients who received three cycles of our chop, and they then went on to receive two cycles of HIDAC therapy, and then 60 of them were randomized, 30 to ortezomib as a maintenance, and 30 um, who just received observation. And as you can see in the, in the bottom box, five-year event-free survival, and the overall survival in both arms were no different. And so the authors concluded that um, there was no indication that Belkin maintenance after ASCT improved outcome in mantle cell patients. Um, you know, there's a lot of interest, obviously, in maintenance therapies. Rituximab is a standard maintenance therapy in this context. And they suggested that ibrutinib and other uh, newer drugs may be um, went out ultimately over rituximab as a, a standard option post-transplant. We could go, Sam, to the next slide. Um, true or false, first-line treatment with venetoclax and obinutuzumab is more costly than first-line regimens consisting of chemotherapy and ibrutinib-based therapies for CLL. And you know, Ben, I imagine, do we have, I, it just occurred to me, can we see the responses from the audience? It should be in the poll section. Um, so underneath the participants, chat, question and answer, there is polling. And uh, once everybody submits it, we should be able to see that. Sam, can you explain? Yeah, so it looks like there's two minutes left in the poll, um, and we have 12% of people have finished. So you have to go into the sidebar for the polling, and then you should see the questions pop up that you can answer. Okay, well, I think probably for the interest of time, we really won't um, sit down that. But uh, true or false, first-line treatment with uh, venetoclax and obesity. And it is more costly than first line regimens consisting of immunotherapies such as FCR and ibrutinib based therapies for CLL. Sure, just to interrupt for a second, uh, Dr. Oler, if you could mute yourself, uh, that would be very helpful. Sam, could we go to the next slide? Yes. 
Um, so the answer is false. Um, introducing venetoclax and obinutuzumab in the first line treatment setting for patients with CL results in significant cost savings compared to first line regimens consisting of chemotherapies and ibrutinib based therapies. And this was something that Dr. Venukopal um, kind of touched on a little bit in his presentation, which is the, the challenge of how to um, sequence these drugs in a cost effective fashion. And he also talked about combining um, venetoclax and ibrutinib with BPKIs as in conjunction with monoclonals. And we know that that is a potentially very powerful way of treating patients with CLL, but the, the costs associated with these things are just astronomical. And so I think there's a whole new and emerging field looking at just how to sequence and what are the cost issues when we think about sequencing, not just the, the benefits. So if we could go, Sam, to the next slide. So this was a study that was um, presented, and it basically looked at um, a, um, the cost of care and budget impact of a 12-month fixed duration regimen of V plus LD compared with other regimens. And you can see on the second bullet that those regimens that they were comparing to were FCR, Venda plus Rituxin, OB plus Corambucil, Ibrutinib, and Ibrutinib and Rituxin, or Ibrutinib and Rituxin and OB. And they were looking at total cost savings, including U.S. specific costs associated with treatment. And they also tried to factor in such things as, as adverse events, routine care, and monitoring. And if you go to the bottom, it says by year three, the cumulative difference in total cost of care of V plus OB compared with Ibrutinib, Ibrutinib plus OB, and, o, and Ibrutinib plus Rituximab mounted to roughly $300 to $350,000 in cost savings. So these are not trivial uh, numbers to consider as we struggle through how best to sequence these drugs. Uh, the cost of care is going to be a big issue. And in some areas of the country or in the world, um, venomustine and rituxin is still going to be a very attractive option, at least in the frontline setting. Um, in this um, paper, however, the conclusion was introducing venetoclax plus OB among first-line CLL treatment to a U.S. health plan resulted in cost savings compared to a plan with chemo and immunotherapies and ibrutinib-based therapies, which had um, basically maintenance built into them. Um, we could go to the next slide. So this is a true or false question. And it's BTKI therapy does not provide good outcomes in venetoclax resistant CLL. And I think that Dr. Benekopal did a great job of talking about this in his slide. So I'm hoping that everyone gets this absolutely correct. And if we could go to the next slide. False. And in interpreting and in assessing alternative treatments of venetoclax for patients with relapse, relapse or refractory CLL. Researchers observed that patients with BCL2, GLY-101 valve, and adeplex resistance mutation responded well to BTKI therapy. And this was exactly what Dr. Venner-Kapal showed in several of his slides with a larger cohort. And if we could go to the next slide. So this was a small study that was just published in Blood uh, two weeks ago. And they basically looked at 23 patients with relapsed or refractory CLL who had received either ibrutinib or, in a couple of instances, danibrutinib. Um, what they looked at was the progression-free survival and the overall survival after they had originally um, uh, received the metaclax. And what they found was that, yes, these patients could be transitioned safely to a BTKI inhibitor, and that BTKI inhibitor was um, quite effective, and about 70% of these patients had a significant response, and that um, duration of response was roughly 34 months. We could go to the next slide. 
um, true or false, and I was thinking about pulling this slide, but we'll put it in since we have it here, um, as we'll be hearing more about AML in the next sessions. But um, all of the following regimens are recommended in elderly patients with de novo AML. Uh, azacitidine and venetoclax, low-dose C and venetoclax, acetabine times five days in venetoclax, and decitabine times 10 days in venetoclax. And um, this was, a, I put this one in here because it was one of these small studies that actually would impact the way I treat. And right now we really don't know how to use low-dose C versus decitabine for AML, but some people have more experience with one or the other. And consequently, they use one more than the other. And of course, azacitidine is a cost-effective option for these patients as well. Um, Sam, could we go to the next slide? So um, the answer I put was false. And this was um, just based on a Lancet hematology article that is in press, and it showed that in a phase two trial of decitabine schedules in older patients with newly diagnosed AML, the efficacy and safety of a five and 10 day schedule um, was different, and it favored actually the five-day schedule. And so if we could go to the next slide. And basically what they showed, it's a busy slide, and I don't want to spend too much time on it. I think these slides will be available to you if you want to look at them later. But basically they showed that the efficacy was no difference, no different between five and, and ten days of decetabine. But if you look at the second bullet, it was really quite different in terms of adverse events. And 16% um, of patients died from infection. They were in the 10-day group versus 4% in the five-day group. And so um, these authors concluded that these results had implications for delivery of cost-effective care as they suggested additional doses of decitabine could raise treatment prices without providing additional benefit. And in fact, could be more uh, toxic. So maybe um, as we think about it, five days, much as we might with azacitidine, seven days as we might use with um, azacitidine in conjunction with uh, a venetic plex vaccine. Um, if we could go, Sam, to the next slide, please. Um, and so this one is a fill in the blank, and it's an A, B, or C. Rituximab plus blank, followed by autologous stem cell transplant, was associated with high rates of durable remission in transplant eligible for mantle cell lymphoma. And the choices are listed below as Brexa, Bortez, and Bendamustine. And could go to the next slide. Sam, if we could, yeah, thank you. The answer is bendamustine or answer C. And it was the, the choice and the, way, the one that you was associated with with unusually high response rate. And if we could go to the next slide, please. So this was um, a pooled analysis, and it came from uh, Dana-Farber Institute in Wash U, and they looked at 88 patients who um, received induction followed by consolidation of chemotherapy. Um, and what they found was that um, rituximab and bendamustine was uniquely um, effective in this group, and you can see that the response rates were on order of 97%, and complete responses were 90%. So in terms of an induction regimen for young patients who are going to be moved on to transplant, bendamustine and rituxan, followed by RSC um, for two additional cycles, uh, may be a uniquely good option for these folks. So I'm going to stop there. Those are the questions, and I don't know how we did, or I can't, oh, I can see um, the answers on the right. So um, I'll stop there, and Shalinder, I'll send it back to you.